トの新しい本を書いたのを見たときに、ね、あの呼びたいなと思いまして。ウェビナーを開始しますかってボタンがあったので押したらレコーディング始まっちゃいました。ああ、そうですか。じゃあ止めましょうね。Welcome.、Uh, we will、uh, start shortly. Okay,、uh, let's get started.、Um, good evening,、uh, good afternoon,、uh, good morning,、uh, depending on where you are.、Um, welcome to、uh, SMU Tower Center Sunstar webinar series.、Uh, I'm delighted to、uh, introduce uh, today's speaker,、uh, Dr. Motohiro Tsuchiya,、uh, my old friend,、uh, and also Senpai,、uh, my, uh, which means uh, uh, my、um, senior colleague. Um, before starting、uh, today's seminar,、uh, today's webinar,、uh, I'd like to thank、uh, Bora Lazzi and Jenny Apelti、uh, for organizing、uh, this webinar series.、Uh, I also、uh, appreciate、uh, the partnership、uh, with Japan Metro Society Data Support Wars. And also, I thank Japan Airlines for、uh, their generous support for SMU Tower Center and、uh, SMU in Japan program at Kansei Gakuin University. Today, we are going to talk about a very interesting and exciting topic cybersecurity. And we have the best person to talk about, Dr. Motohiro Tsuchiya.、Um, a few years ago,、uh, in the Tower Center, we were discussing what would be the biggest risk for US national security and international politics in general. Our conclusion was cybersecurity is the biggest risk. For both US national security and uh, uh, international politics. The reason is we don't know what it is. So,、uh, Dr. Tsuchiya、uh, is the best person to talk about、uh, what cybersecurity is and what, the, what risk、uh, we are facing. A few years ago, when uh, US, uh, one of the top uh, uh, diplomats of the United States visited the Tower Center, the first question he asked me was, Whether I knew、uh, Dr. Motohiro Tsuchiya. And he said that you know, he, was,、uh, he, was, he knows everything about cyber. <laughs> he's, a big,、uh, he's a leading expert of cyber. So,、uh, so when Dr. Tsuchiya、uh, published uh, his uh, most recent book,、uh, Cyber Great Game、uh, in Japanese, I'd like to、uh, introduce this book to、um, uh, the audience of the Tower Center. So uh, I uh, invited、uh, Dr. Tsuchiya, and uh, he um, generously uh, accepted our um, um, invitation. And so today we will hear from、uh, Dr. Tsuchiya. So please join me for、um, welcoming、uh, Dr. Tsuchiya.、Uh, thank you very much, Takeuchi Sensei,、um, for inviting me to this wonderful event. So, I, 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 I don't think I'm the best, but so I'm trying to、um, provide something、um, uh, interesting, I hope. But so I will talk about cybersecurity, but something different from ordinary、uh, cybersecurity perspective. So,、um, let me share、uh, my slides.、Um, Again, so my title is Cyber Grid Game、um, um, Geopolitics and Geoeconomics for Data.、Um, I will start from the old great game. So, the old great game was coined by、uh, Rudyard Kipling、uh, 120 years ago. So, he wrote a novel called Kim, titled Kim. So,、uh, this novel Uh, is talking about intelligence activities between the British Empire and Tsarist Russia、uh, in Central Asia and India. The boy, uh, uh, his name is Kim, Kimball,、uh, was born in India, but his father was a、um, British、um, military、uh, officer. But he lost their parents, his parents. And so he was.、Um, Alone in India, but he traveled with a Buddhist monk and he was involved in uh, um, this uh, great game. So it is just a background of the novel. So、uh, you don't need to read this book. Um, um, but so、um, 
strategists in Central Asia or maybe Europe and the United States uh, is imagining what's going on um, um, 120 years ago. I will show you a map. So um, there was a Tsarist Russia uh, 100 years ago. Um, um, in, the, in the sea, there were uh, British Empire colonies, especially India. Um, India was a, a big colony of the British Empire. And this is a kind of um, um, battlefield for intelligence activities between the um, uh, British Empire and the um Russia. So after um, three years of the publication of the novel, there was a um, uh, war between Russia and Japan. Uh, it's a, a japan russia war in 1904. So the Russia was trying to expand their um, territories. And so they want to go um, beyond, go uh, get out of the Eurasian continent. And after the uh, uh, Russian um, um, revolution, so Russia became the Soviet Union. And the, on the um, ocean side, the British Empire was replaced by the United States. But they were still uh, struggling over uh, the uh, influence in Central Asia and India. And so there was uh, there's a, um, 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 a invasion by the Soviet Union uh, to um, uh, Central Asia. And it happened um, uh, in 1970s. Um, but so it's still a big problem in this area. And in geopolitics, we are talking about heartland. It's a central part of the um, Russia. But um, some geopolitical uh, scholars say Greenland is more important. So uh, if you imagine the um, um, many conflicts from the Cold War to today, so Germany was divided. And Middle East is always a um, conflicting places. And so India, Pakistan, um, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, China, and Korean Peninsula. These battling places are located in Rimland, a uh, ring of the Eurasian continent. But this is an important place to think about today's international relations. Well, how about cyberspace? So people say cyberspace is borderless uh, domain. We should not talk about the geography of cyberspace, but is it true? So these four countries, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, are named by uh, United States government that they are launching cyber attacks. So they are located in Eurasian continent or Rimland, rim of the Eurasian continent. Here is a map uh, of the communication cables, uh, landline cables and undersea cables mapped by the International Telecommunications Union. So uh, the old heartland is not a big problem anymore. Rimland is uh, more important than heartland. So Europe, uh, India, and uh, Southeast um, Asia, Taiwan, China, Japan, Korean Peninsula, these areas are connected more than other areas and cyber attacks are happening in Rimland. We are talking about China, US um, technology conflict these days, uh, of course, um, trading wars. But uh, October uh, uh, 2018, uh, three years ago, the so Bloomberg, um, uh, carried a news titled The Big Hack, How China Used a Tiny Chip to Infiltrate U.S. Companies. So um, the, uh, this news report says, so China embedded a very tiny chip in a server assembled in the United States. So a company um, provided a, a motherboard of, uh, ser over server and servers were assembled in another US companies and shipped to many companies. But one company uh, was using this server in um, their company and found something wrong. So tiny signal uh, traffics are going to somewhere. 
and they found a tiny chip in the server. It was not designed in the original uh, server um, uh, uh, motherboard, but these kind of chips are embedded in motherboards. And these servers were sold to many US companies. One of them is um, Amazon Web Service. Um, it's a cloud service of Amazon. So a lot of people are using uh, Amazon uh, Web Service these days. And their customers included Central Intelligence Agency, United States Navy, and Department of Defense of the US government. Chinese actor might try to get data from the Amazon Web Service. And so they are trying to embed um, uh, tiny chips to steal data from servers. In December 2018, uh, two months after the uh, Bloomberg report, we found that Huawei is in trouble. So daughter of the founder of the Huawei was arrested in Canada, and she was a chief financial officer of Huawei. And so um, the um, charge was done based on the um, um, violation of um, sanction against I Iran, uh, not connected to the uh, uh, China-US uh, technology conflict. But many of us, including me, um, connected uh, this incident to the China-US technological uh, confrontation. And we were talking about supply chain risks. There were two types of supply chain risks, actually. One is embedded in production points. So Huawei is um, uh, blamed for uh, this point. So Huawei is embedding, might be embedding um, um, some uh, supply chain risks in their products. So if, I, I don't have any evidence of that, but uh, if they are doing it, so all the customers are affected. So that's too much the US government is um, saying. But another process is, um, is embedded, embed something in transportation process. So US government um, is uh, said that doing this. So, um, National Security Agency might be um, requesting to um, um, take a package in the transportation process and embed something, but they are targeting something. So for national security or diplomatic reasons, but China is doing uh, it without reasons. So everyone, everyone can be a targeted. Uh, in Chinese uh, supply chain risk. That's a different thing the US government uh, is saying. So China is um, struggling after the Huawei um, uh, sanction. So um, China it, it cannot get um, advanced technologies from uh, other countries, including Taiwan, Japan, and the United States. Now China is trying to um, uh, produce their own technologies um, and under the projects called Military Civil Fusion or uh, Made in China 2025. The Chinese government uh, is not using these terms anymore, but we know that the China or Chinese companies are trying to uh, develop their own technologies uh, with their money, their technology, with their people. So uh, China is trying to replace supply chain, supply chain um, um, with their own technologies. Is this a cyber war? Um, mass media always are using this term, but um, cybersecurity scholars are using the term change of operational domains. It's not, it might not be a real war, but something new is happening in operational domains. Conventional operational domains are land, sea, and air. Um, oh, sorry, I missed the um, D in G and, so I'm sorry about that. So, but we are having uh, um, uh, ground forces and Navy and air forces. So uh, this is a conventional um, uh, operational domain. 
But fourth operational domain, we are calling it space, out of space. So space is um, now integrated in um, uh, operational domains. But the fifth operational domain is cyberspace. Um, what is cyberspace? I'm using a computer today to present my talk uh, with, um, um, in this seminar. But I think the real figure of cyberspace is not something floating in the sky. It's not cloud at all. We are using computers or sometimes our smartphones and we are connecting those devices uh, through channels, wired uh, networks or wireless uh, networks. And where those data go, it's um, servers, uh, storage devices in data centers. So cyberspace is a very physical existence, not software only. Of course, we are using softwares. So we always talk about cybersecurity in terms of software, so penetration or hacking or other things. But cyberspace is, is very physical. We are talking about IoT, um, uh, Internet of Things. Yes, we are connecting a lot of things and they are also physical. We are using software and um, hardware together. So we have to think about the physical side of cybersecurity. So this is a real figure of our cyberspace. So a lot of servers are somewhere you don't know where those servers are located, but we are dependent on these servers. Maybe some of you are using Gmail. Um, Gmail is a kind of um, cloud email service for free. We, are, we do not care where those servers are located, but someone is operating data centers for Gmail services and other internet services. By the way, I took a sabbatical leave uh, several years ago. Uh, I spent one year in Hawaii, so my colleagues are very angry with me. So research in Hawaii? No, you cannot do that. So, but I did. I did cybersecurity uh, research in Hawaii because um, I hope you remember Edward Snowden. Uh, so he is now in Russia, but before he, flew to Hong Kong to appear on media. He was spending one year in Hawaii and he downloaded a lot of data, top secret data in Hawaii because National Security Agency is located in Hawaii. So they have a big, big facility to monitor Asian communication in Hawaii. So I was trying to understand what Edward Snowden was doing in Hawaii, and I was trying to understand the Asia Pacific security there. But I had more time, uh, so um, I was relaxing. And one day I was walking on the street and found this cover. So it's a traffic signal. Hmm. So I was interested. So I opened that cover. I found these cables. This is not the internet, I think. These cables are not connected to the internet, but this is the same technology. It's a cyber system. So cyberspace is becoming bigger and bigger than the internet. And you will see this kind of box uh, on streets. So one day, so I found this and I was interested, I opened it. You will see this kind of device inside. This is not the internet, but this is cyber systems. It's a part of cyberspace. Cyberspace is becoming bigger and bigger these days, and we are dependent on these systems. So if you go underground of Tokyo streets, you will see this kind of tunnel. We call it Todo in Japanese, but I think there are many tunnels underground of the big cities to host cables, optic fibers. I took, a, this, I took this picture in Berlin, Germany. So this is not a big tunnel, but a lot of cables are embedded uh, underground. And if you want an um, optic fiber service at home, 
So somebody will come to your house and hook cables. Well, if I want to disrupt your communications, I can cut the cable to disrupt your communication. You cannot do online um, study, online teaching, online uh, uh, work, telework anymore. We are dependent on these physical cyber, cable, cyber systems. So I want to talk about submarine cables today. So Japan is an island country. So 99% of international traffic goes through submarine cables in Japan's case. Just 1% goes through international, uh, uh, artificial satellites. But satellites are um, more expensive and slower. So if you remember, so um, all time international telephone call, if I say, hello, it takes a moment to respond, hello. So, but now you, we can using, um, we are using um, Zoom and the, uh, WebEx and the other things. Uh, there's no um, latency anymore. So we are using submarine cables for globalization. So here's a map of the uh, East Asia. So this is a very busy place uh, for, uh, in terms of submarine cables. We are connecting a lot of uh, cyber, uh, undersea cables today. So some cables are coming from the west coast of the United States. And they, those cables are hitting Tokyo or, or uh, Shima in western part of Japan. And those cables go to uh, Korea, Taiwan, and China and other Asian countries. But where are cables are located? That's my question in Hawaii. I went to Hanauma Bay. So Hanauma Bay is very famous for tropical fish. You will see a lot of uh, tropical fish on the uh, left side of this beach. But I went to um, 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 uh, another place. I asked the question, uh, lifeguards, I want to see it, where is it? They said, oh, over there. Where is it? 1956, they blew a corals by dynamite. It never happens today. So it's a big disaster. So it, it's a big um, disruption of natural uh, nature, but they did um, many years ago. Why? They embedded submarine cables. So I went there and I took this video to find um, where those cables are. You will see two cables pipes um, in the center of the video now. It's easy to locate um, submarine cables at the bottom of the sea. These cables are very old, so it's okay to um, mention the, uh, where they were, but uh, it's, it's very critical to know where those cables are. Now we're uh, watching, uh, seeing um, uh, articles talking about Russian submarines or Chinese submarines. They are trying to find the location of American submarine cables to disrupt US economy, Japanese economy, or Taiwan economy. We are dependent on those cables and someone might cut, disrupt, destroy those cables in a, a time of conflict. But one day I went to another beach called Makaha in Hawaii, island of Oahu. This is not a tourist spot at all. This is a, um, before the pandemic actually. But why I went there? Because I found this map in the library. It says, here's a coastline. So left side is ocean. So um, right side is um, uh, land side. And so the map says here, are a lot of cables are buried at the bottom of the sea. And the map also says, here is a maintenance hole, manhole. And I went there and I found a manhole and um, I was interested, I opened it. No, I didn't open it. So I found this picture somewhere else. But these kinds of cables are under the manhole, maintenance hole. It's easy to destroy cables without diving into the bottom of the sea. It's very, very vulnerable. We are dependent of those physical uh, infrastructures. 
how we can protect them. So sometimes we can see these kind of signs. We know where those caves are. And I found this sign in the, um, uh, at the beach or in Japan. It says optic fiber cable are buried here. They tell us where they are, where those cables are. Again, here's a map of the undersea cable in East Asia. We know um, where those cables are connected. In Japan's case, Tokyo and Shima. In Korean case, around the Pusan. Taiwan, North and South. China, Shanghai, Shantou, and Hong Kong. Before the pandemic, every time I go to these countries, I try to locate the cable landing station. The upper left is in Chiba, uh, very close to Tokyo, uh, Chikula Cable Landing Station. Upper right is in, in the United Kingdom. It's an old one. Uh, it was um, constructed during the uh, Cold War and they were worrying about the atomic uh, nuclear weapons. So they are building, so they are putting the uh, main facilities underground. Um, um, down left is the Singapore cable landing station, very near Changi Airport. And um, uh, um, lower right is Taiwan. So uh, cables from this landing station goes to China. It's easy to locate cable landing station, but this is a part of critical infrastructure in many countries. And who are producing cables? So only three companies are um, uh, almost um, um, monopolizing the market. US Subcom, Japanese NEC, European ASN. ASN means uh, Alcatel Submarine Networks. But China is trying to um, uh, enter this market. Huawei was uh, um, holding a, a section for undersea cables. But after the Trump administration's um, uh, aggressive approach to China, Huawei sold this uh, cable section to another company, another Chinese company. Now the company is called HMN Tech. So it means Huawei Marine Networks Technology, but they are hiding Huawei name these days. So their market share is less than 10%, but they are trying to expand their market share in many parts of the world. But I think cable themselves itself is not a big problem anymore. So the more important part is um, land site, cable landing station. We are hosting cable landing stations and inside the stations, we are seeing these kind of machines called submarine line termination equipment. So Huawei is um, producing these kind of um, uh, machines and other companies also uh, uh, producing these machines. So here are major companies producing SLTE, we are competing in this area. So if you have um, SLTE from foreign sources, can we trust it? It's a simple question, but it's happening all over the world now. Cable is just a cable, so they are sending uh, optic signals. But after arriving cable landing station, we have to process these signals that's the important part, actually. So that's why the US government um, set out a, a policy called Clean Networks, uh, August 2020. Uh, of course, Trump administration, administration left. So um, this uh, uh, initiative is not mentioned anymore. But I think Biden administration are also uh, taking same approach to um, secure our system cyberspace. So in that sense, we are starting a new game. Uh, I call it a new great game, cyber great game. So we are doing cyber intelligence activities. It's a very important part. Why we have to do it? We have to um, um, attribute who are doing, who are launching cyber attacks against us. And we have to deter those actors in cyberspace. So cyber activities, cyber espionage, cyber attacks are very, very active these days. We have to stop them, but it's quite difficult who are doing what.
so we had um no uh, japan didn't have it but so u.s governments are part of the five eyes so five eyes activities are a very old one started in the during the cold war they are sharing analog wireless communication intelligence uh, among us uk canada uh, australia and new zealand but we have to have an, another newer cyber alliance i think so um, from the US perspective, um, Atlantic side, UK is the best partner. So no one denies it. But who is a partner on the Pacific side? I hope Japan can be a partner. But these three countries are not enough. Japan is now a part of Quad, US, Japan, uh, Australia, and India. I want to add the United Kingdom to this um, framework for cybersecurity. Why we want to contain Eurasia. I said China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran um, launching cyber, atta cyber attacks against us or cyber espionage or cyber uh, crimes. We have to watch these countries. We have to share intelligence among us. So we have to stop cyber attacks, cyber um, espionage, cyber um, crimes uh, originated, originating from these countries. But what we have to protect, I say, what is the heartland in cyber grid game? Actually two, again, the first one is data center. We have to protect data from our enemies because our, our asset, our wealth is stored as digital data. Maybe you have some deposit in um, your bank, but your money is not coins or paper money anymore. Your money is digitized and stored in data centers. We see a lot of data centers all over the world these days. This is a, a one example by Google. Data center is becoming bigger and bigger these days. But how about security of these data centers? This is a um, um, data center in France. This is not Google's data center. But so this data center started a fire and they lost facilities. Can you store your money in data centers like this. Physical security or software security of data center is becoming um, a bigger risk these days. And second thing we have to protect is our brain, our cognition, our cognitive space. So a lot of people are trying to manipulate your way of thinking, your knowledge. We are dependent on social media these days. A lot of people using Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, and other things. We are reading a lot of messages from other people, but we are almost drunk with social media. We are believing what we are reading also on social media. I don't know much about Q, but some people were believing that Q would come in the election of US presidential election. And so um, um, President Trump said, uh, we're gonna walk down to the Capitol. And drunken people, drunken with social media, they went to Capitol Hill and started violence. It's unbelievable. But so they were believing something. So some people are trying to manipulate your way of thinking. That's happening these days. President Trump's um, social media accounts were stopped, but other falling actors might try to manipulate your way of thinking. That's a big risk these days. So we are in living in democratic countries. Japan is a democratic country. US is a democratic country. But we are vulnerable. We have 
providing easy access to cable landing station and data centers. I'm not a military officer, I'm not an intelligence guy, but I'm just a professor, but I can find where those stations are located. It's very, very vulnerable. And foreign agents might steer our recognition um, um, through ICT's information communication technologies and our media are not censored, how we can stop those kind of activities. So this is my conclusion. So cyberspace is very physical and cyber powers are competing for access to data centers and our cognitive space in the cyber grid game. This is a new phase of cybersecurity these days. And can we form a new cyber alliance to contain Eurasia? So battle space is not cloud in the sky. So we're connecting physical and software uh, sides of the cyberspace. They are twin, they are connected, they are mixed. So it's quite difficult to respond to cyber threats these days. Thank you very much for your attention. I want to stop here and I'm, I'm very uh, happy to um, hear your comments and the question. Thank you very much, Takeo Sensei. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Chia san. Uh, it was wonderful. Um, and also, uh, to me, it was counterintuitive. So uh, I didn't think that you know, cyber was so uh, physical. Uh, and so uh, it's a little bit now, like, uh, to me, like less, uh, less abstract, uh, more tangible. Um, I'm not sure whether it is a good thing. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but um, so uh, um, so those uh, who are, uh, if you have any question or anything um, you want to uh, discuss, uh, please uh, write it in uh, in the Q and A box, uh, and I will try to uh, include your questions um, into uh, our discussion. So, um, um, so I'd like to start with a um, um, question from uh, Savini Desai. Um, our uh, student um, at the SMU. Um, so um, her question is, are submarine cables um, like a physical uh, infrastructure, um, the most vulnerable aspect of the US cybersecurity or um, should we be more concerned about hacks in the um, outdated electric grid uh, or uh, in federal agency servers or like uh, anything like that? So, are we going to, what are we concerned about uh, most? Uh, and then like, uh, also, could you like, uh, remind us of like a listing, um, list of the concerns, a uh, list of uh, uh, concerns uh, that we should have. So uh, like a physical um, um, object like a cable, submarine cables, and then at the same time, uh, hacking, uh, also, you talked about, uh, uh, it was very interesting, cognitive space, <laughs> like social media, how to manage, that's such a very big issue. Um, so uh, how would you evaluate you know, those like, uh, various concerns and which one is more um, concerned? Uh, thank you very much for the question. It's, it's really difficult to um, uh, put the priorities in um, these things. But so if we talk about cybersecurity these days, we are, um, we tend to focus on um, a software side. So somebody is trying to penetrate into your um, uh, computer by remote, or uh, um, maybe uh, someone is trying to steal your data or something like that. So these are uh, um, higher risks actually. So we have to protect, uh, from, uh, protect us from those attacks. Uh, but so I want to um, stress the physical side too. So we are always ignoring the physical side of the cyberspace. So we are very, very vulnerable. So um, as you know, um, if you are taking classes at home, maybe we are dependent on how much bandwidth your house uh, it, uh, holds. So if you have a thinner connection, you will lose data. So you cannot um, um, uh, listen to your teachers uh, well. But this is not software side, this is a, um, also physical side. So um, cyberspace is very physical and we are dependent on, um, on those facilities. And if we lose our facilities, 
So we cannot do anything. So software might be fixed, um, and, but if you lose connection, so if you lose optic fiber at home, you cannot connect at all. Maybe you have 5G connection by mobile phones. That should be okay, um, but um, it's not perfect. So we have to have multiple channels and those kind of things are more complicated and difficult to manage these days. So um, in Japan's case, again, so we are island country. So we're dependent on undersea cables and Taiwan is also an island country. So they are dependent on it. And I was in Hawaii, Hawaii is islands. So they are dependent on undersea cables. Why Hawaii? So um, Hawaii is hosting the headquarter of Indo-PACOM, Indo-Pacific Command of the US forces. So um, if something happens in Korean Peninsula, Taiwan Straits, Japan, or Indian Ocean, so uh, the headquarter of the US forces are located in Hawaii. But if Hawaii lose connection, communication connection, what will happen? So I talked about the um, submarine cables today, but satellites are also vulnerable. We have a lot of um, satellite station on the ground, so they are vulnerable. So we can access these facilities. If we destroy the cable, uh, uh, some satellite stations on the ground, satellites are useless. We cannot use satellite communication anymore. So we are too much dependent on communications. So we have to think about um, um, physical side and um, software side together. That's my um, argument, actually. Great, thank you. Um, so actually following up actually from uh, coming from um, uh, Nori Katagiri, uh, political scientist teaching at Centralist University. Mm -hmm. um, he is an uh, expert of uh, uh, traditional uh, security like right, based on military. Um, so uh, he raises a question of like, um, this is actually a good follow-up question that is, um, so uh, it seems like uh, um, physical uh, infrastructures are very uh, vulnerable. So uh, what has held potential aggressors so long from attacking those <laughs> submarine cables? Uh, if information about their location is so public and uh, if they are so, uh, if they are so uh, vulnerable. Um, and uh, so, uh, and then in, uh, in your view, uh, view um, under what condition uh, would they actually take action to physically disrupt the cables? Thank you very much. That's a good question, actually. So um, if I talk about this kind of threats um, with cable uh, operators, they are somehow angry with me. No, 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 no. It's not a big problem anymore mm -hmm. because we have a lot of cables. So enemies cannot destroy every single cable at the same time. So if we lose one cable, so the traffic goes to another cable. That's easy, they say. Yes, maybe, maybe. Um, but, um, and another point they say is that uh, fishermen are destroying cables most. So um, they are doing the um, fishing at the bottom of the sea. I don't know how to say in English, but so they are using um, heavy nets. So um, um, draw, uh, dragging at the bottom of the sea. Those nets uh, sometimes destroy cables. Um, it ha it's happening maybe almost every two weeks uh, somewhere in the world. And earthquakes sometimes destroy cables. So it happened 10 years ago at the East, um, uh, I, I don't know, uh, East, big, uh, East Great Earthquakes in Tohoku area of Japan. So NTT Communications lost um, uh, four cables uh, uh, among five cables they, are, they were owning. So um, just one cable survived. So these kind of things happening um, um, always somewhere in the world. But I'm worrying about something might happen. For example, we hosted the Olympic games. So we are focusing on something big event and we are worrying about losing uh, streaming um, uh, from the Tokyo to the world. So um, if we lose cables, we have latency and sometimes we cannot send um, enough signals to the world. And someone tried to disrupt um, several games, not all, but several came at the same time. So these traffics 
may be uh, delayed and financial services will struggle. So um, several years ago, um, there was a big earthquake in Taiwan. They lost the cable of the coast. And so Tokyo um, um, investors cannot access the uh, um, um, Hong Kong market or Singapore market. Mm. So they have to go around the other side of the globe. So their communications were too slow. They couldn't compete with others uh, without uh, shortest cables. So uh, submarine cables uh, could be laid in the shortest distance. That's an important thing for financial services. So if you are um, clever and you want to raise, uh, get a lot of money, steal a lot of money, maybe you can invest in, in the market and you can destroy cables. Something might happen and you can um, take advantage of the incident so you can get a lot of money. That might things happen. And another thing is the military side. So I talked about the um, uh, Paycom headquarters in Hawaii. So if we if they lose some of the connections, some of the cable connection in Hawaii, they will put um, uh, traffic go to the uh, artificial satellites. But artificial satellites don't have enough capacity for all the traffic of military operations. Now we are using a lot of drones. Drones are sending a lot of signals uh, for video uh, communications. They need a lot of bandwidth. So those kind of communication might be disrupted. So um, it's not easy to destroy all the cables, but some cables, if we lose, so um, our operation, finance sector or military service might be disrupted. That's the point I'm worrying about. Okay, thank you. Um, David Kahn, our um, Tower Center Forum member um, uh, working for uh, Tesla's instrument, um, he actually asked the question of the uh, uh, regulation um, and uh, who is responsible for um, um, the, um, how should I say, um, the safety and um, uh, management of those uh, um, uh, physical infra infrastructure, so uh, and the data centers. Um, so um, she, he asks, uh, are you aware of any uh, industry standard? Uh, or at the minimum, uh, best practices on safety and security of uh, these facilities, such as uh, data centers. And uh, he says I do he doubts uh, there is any government spe specifications uh, either. So uh, it's kind of government involvement, uh, regulation, and uh, who is responsible for managing <laughs> those uh, physical infrastructure? It's, it's very weak, actually. So. Um... These facilities are owned by, purely owned by um, um, commercial companies, not owned by the government. So I talked about the military side, but so um, military services are also uh, renting uh, cables from the commercial companies. So commercial companies are responsible for protection of these facilities. So during the Cold War, uh, the governments are worrying about the losing connection. So they uh, uh, heavily, um, the, uh, um, uh, cable landing stations are heavily armed. So one of the cable landing stations in Hawaii is inside the Air Force facility. I wanted to see it, but I had no connection to the military, so I couldn't see it. But one day I talked to um, someone in the com uh, communication company. So he said, oh, I can access to them. So he took me to the facility, but I I am not take. Uh, I was not allowed to take any pictures, but it's a heavily armed, heavily um, under the security. But many, many, most of the cable landing stations and data centers today are, um, are civilian, so not protected by the military forces or police forces. Uh, you can identify the location by uh, through Google and. It's easy to access, actually. So I asked the US government, Department of Homeland Security one day. So someone introduced um, um, a DHS officer to me. So I sent an email to him. So I want to know how the US government is protecting these facilities. Um, he didn't reply at all. So um, I, and I asked the same question to someone in person. So how do you protect it? Um, I cannot tell you. 
Mm, okay. And I asked the same question to the Japanese government. So they didn't care at all. So that's why I took them to the one of the cable landing station. This is the um, real figure of cable, standing, cable landing station. How do you protect it? Hmm. So they have now started talking about it, discussing about it inside the government. The one good example is Australian government. So they are hiding the location of cable landing stations. It's not available on the internet. So um, I, I want to know, I try to find the location address, physical address of cable landing station in Australia. So it's, it's quite difficult. I have not identified it yet. I did it several years ago. I don't know today, but so they were trying to hide it. So um, I think more um, governments push the commercial companies to hide their locations and protect, um, 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 uh, raise the protection. And one thing, uh, one more thing, um, I'm, I'm talking longer, sorry about that. Oh, no, no, no. And there is a, a committee, commercial uh, side committee, ICPC, yeah. International Cable Protection Committee. It's not an intergovernmental organization. It's a commercial company's alliance to protect the uh, cable. But they are not talking about the terrorists or military operations. They are worrying about the fishermen or earthquakes or um, maybe sometimes anchors of big um, uh, ships. Um, but we have to watch more um, security, um, national security side. So I talked about this um, uh, last year during the uh, big cable, submarine cable conference. And they said, oh, oh, I know, we know, but you should not talk about it. That's their response. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about the uh, uh, protection of a data center. Uh, how about uh, another uh, aspect that is a cognitive space? So uh, Kiri McNamee, uh, our, our student, um, asks, um, so uh, could you discuss the responsibility to regulate uh, the private platforms to protect our cognitive space? And should they be self-regulated by the company that owns them, uh, or does the government have a responsibility to step in? Yeah, it's a uh, um, hotly discussed yeah. um, agenda these days. So in the US, I believe uh, Communications Decency Act, so uh, which was enacted twenty-five years ago. So, um, so it came back, um, and. So the Congress is discussing the possible regulation over um, social media. It, it might be very difficult um, in democracies like the United States. It, it's almost impossible in Japan too. So we are worrying about too much censorship. We cannot regulate the Twitter, um, Facebook. Of, of course they are um, American companies. So Japanese companies have less um, authority to uh, regulate those companies, those foreign companies. But uh, some countries um, um, regulating social media uh, a lot, China, Russia, um, Middle Eastern countries are regulating the use of the social media. So the latest, latest example is Myanmar. So the government is regulating people's use of the internet. So those regulations might be bigger in the world. I'm worrying about it. But um, I'm worrying about the protection security of the people too. So it's quite difficult to protect our cognitive space these days. Um, um, so discussion versus discussion, it takes time. So fake news, it's easy to um, um, be more popular than um, real news, true news. It's, it's, it's um, almost losing battle. So I don't know which is the best solution for that, but we have to aware of the possible intervention from the foreign agents into your cognitive space. Okay, thank, thank you, that's uh, interesting. Um, I have tried to uh, ask this question. So, um, well, 
when I read your book and then like uh, now I heard your uh, presentation, I wonder why is this uh, part of military? So uh, you said, uh, so uh, traditionally uh, there are three divisions. Um, so uh, like army, navy and air force. So like uh, land, sea and uh, um, air. And then now like uh, two, two more uh, new you know, divisions like uh, space and uh, 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 cyber. Um, it sounds like, like I'm a political economist and talking a lot about uh, economic regulations. Uh, and uh, it sounds like a very similar to economic regulation. <laughs> Mm. Uh, so governance of cyber sounds like uh, how to regulate the market or, you know, uh, so uh, uh, what is a government job um, and uh, guarantee the safety um, and, uh, in the um, economic transactions. So, um, so, you know, sounds like, and it's very much like um, um, similar to, uh, more similar to economic regulation than like a security issue. Um, but uh, it, I think that you know, every country uh, try to locate, situate this uh, cyber issue uh, or like the management of cyber in the military. So uh, why is this like a you know, military issue? Yeah, it's just an interesting question. So in Japan, we are um, uh, uh, seeing the national election now. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I cannot say the self-defense forces of Japan um, will um, protect the, our election. It's impossible. So we don't see, um, uh, we have cyber defense unit in the national, um, and I'm sorry, um, self-defense forces, but they do not anything um, to protect the national election. But in the US, it's possible. Um, I was surprised at first, but after the 2016 uh, presidential election, um, uh, President Obama was surprised with the result of the election. And we found that um, the Russia intervened, uh, interfered with the uh, presidential election in 2016. So before leaving the White, White House, uh, President Obama made an executive order to add um, election system to the part of the government facilities uh, protected by the, under the regulation of the critical infrastructures. I think, uh, I remember that the so, uh, US government um, named 16 or 17 critical infrastructures. One of them is government facilities. And President Obama added election system to the um, government facility. Then, so US Cyber Command, uh, military force for the cyberspace can protect the national election. It's, it's, it's a big surprise for me. So um, in 2018, uh, midterm election was protected by the uh, US Cyber Command. So they launched a very aggressive um, um, uh, defense operations against Russia. They stopped the uh, Russian interference successfully in the midterm election in 2018. And after that, uh, uh, Commander Nakasone, so he's Japanese American, but General Nakasone said, of the Cyber Command said, so the, our, our highest pro priority is 2020 presidential election. And he did a lot of things to stop the foreign enemies um, coming into your cognitive space through uh, social media. So we found minor incidents in 2020 election, but so um, there's no major interference intervention from the foreign enemies. Of course, Russia did another thing. So they hacked into solar wind system. Uh, solar winds is a uh, cybersecurity company. So uh, they hacked into the system and they stole a lot of data from the uh, US government or US companies. So they, did a big thing, another big thing, but the protect, uh, election itself was protected. So US is something different from other countries. So it's a special case. In other countries, it's quite difficult for military forces to protect national elections. So, um, but 
how to protect democracies, national system, uh, national election system, it's quite difficult um, 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 task for us. So now I'm um, preparing for a co-edited, co-authored book to be uh, published within this year. So the topic is how we can manage um, interference into uh, national elections. So um, maybe I hope you can invite me again next year for the uh, <laughs> launch after the launch of this book. But I'm not sure. So I said too much. Thank you. Well, okay, that's great. Um, I'd like to, so uh, it's not now seven thirty. So, but I'd like to ask um, uh, one more question uh, to conclude uh, this session. Uh, question is uh, actually a little bit broad and or generic, but. Should we be optimistic or pessimistic? And uh, um, probably both, but uh, in what sense? Um, if you have enough um, um, talented people, enough budget and enough technologies, you can be optimistic. But in Japan's case, um, we don't have much budget. We don't have um, many talented people. We are trying to educate more people in for cybersecurity market. But um, so I, I sometimes blame, so universities have to do something more, but I always reply, university students are too late. We have to start from junior high schools or maybe high schools. So younger people are needed in this market. But why they don't want to do cybersecurity? Because you cannot get a lot of money. So security is cost center, not profit center. If you work in a security market, you cannot raise a lot of money. And if something happens, you will be blamed. Oh, that's your responsibility, why we were hacked. You don't want to do it, right? So um, we want to attract more talented people to cybersecurity. Um, it's an interesting job to protect you and your family and your country. So I, uh, but it's still difficult. If you can raise a lot of money from cybersecurity, it would be easier, but it's not happening all over the world. So um, if we see a lot of talented people in cybersecurity, um, 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 market, we can be optimistic more, but um, not so optimistic at this point, unfortunately. Well, then like I have actually, it would, uh, it adds um, me to uh, another question that is, uh, so uh, we have uh, many uh, undergraduate students uh, participating in our discussion today. Um, so uh, what is your message uh, to those undergraduate students? Okay, um, uh, in cybersecurity um, um, domain, we need three types of people. So one is more technical people who understand um, what technologies are used for cyber uh, attacks or something like that, IP address or um, um, uh, secure servers or something like that. Um, but um, we have to have the more strategy people uh, who understand that what is the, our policy to respond to cybersecurity, cyber attacks. So for a, a company president or um, government president, government prime ministers, they have to understand uh, what's going on. And in the middle of these two people, um, someone in the operational layer to understand and interpret what's going on in the technical world. And so um, advise the leadership, what should we do? So even if you are not a technology guy, geeks or nurse, but you can be um, someone to understand technology and so politics or strategy or diplomacy or national security. So I'm also one of them. So I'm kind of interpreter. So I'm talking to the political leaders. What is cyberspace? What are uh, cyber attacks? 
And I'm going to the technical people and you had better understand the political structure. You have to persuade the political leaders to understand your findings. So those kind of people needed. Um, um, so I think you can have three layers, three mm. types of people. Um, so maybe if you are not um, um, technology guy, you can be a, maybe leaders, you can be a, um, a interpreter or translator of these things as an expert. So you can contribute to uh, any layers, I think. Yeah, Savni uh, writes in, uh, some of us are interested in cybersecurity. There is a hope. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, I found that uh, many uh, of our students who are uh, studying international politics are interested in cyber now. So uh, that's great. And then, as, and then we need to be um, educated and enlightened. So uh, for that purpose, this uh, uh, webinar was uh, really great. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chia Sensei, for uh, sharing your insights. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, this is a very important topic. Uh, so please uh, join me for uh, thanking uh, Dr. Tsuchiya. Thank you very much, Takeo Sensei. Thank you, everybody, for listening to my talk. Thank you very much. I hope we can meet in person soon. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I hope like the uh, next time maybe, you know, uh, I'd like to uh, invite Chia Sensei to SMU campus uh, to Dallas. So uh, thank you. Uh, please um, um, stay tuned and uh, hopefully uh, that time uh, will come soon. Uh, but today, um, thank you uh, Chia Sensei uh, for uh, taking time to uh, speak to us. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good night and have a nice day uh, if thank you're you. in Japan. Bye.